Trauma bond is a fear-based connection that occurs between abusers and victims. It is hard to explain this intense attachment that you have. You combine that with the mental confusion of cognitive dissonance, and the victim is stuck. Thank you for joining me here today on Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, a mental health specialist with over 20 years of counseling experience, and I'm a narcissistic abuse survivor. In this podcast, we're going to examine why this powerful dynamic of trauma bond meets cognitive dissonance is so hard to break and why it makes it so difficult for victims to leave. We'll also cover the five types of narcissist, as well as discuss the differences between overt and covert narcissism. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Please leave a review and let us know what you think of the podcast. Subscribe so you don't miss future episodes and consider donating a cost of a cup of coffee as your show of support for our mission to help set victims free from toxic abuse. So let's listen in on this replay of a TikTok Live. One of the things about a drama triangle is that it's pervasive with people who have personality disorders. That's one of the things we don't understand about personality disorders. Most of us don't approach life like that. We approach life from the standpoint of we hit a problem, we talk to the people involved with the problem, and then together we collectively work out a solution. We see it as a linear process from identification to <laughs> identification to solution. We assume that everyone that we meet is works similarly, that they have this same view of a linear pro- process to problem solving. But people who have personality disorders, which roughly, when you take all of them collectively, all 10 collectively, that represents roughly about 20 to 20, 30% of people or more, they're, they are not about solution. They're not, this is not a linear process for them. They have a completely different perspective and a completely different desire and for an outcome. So instead of problem solving, they're not looking to problem solve. They're looking to offload their emotions to you, to someone, and they use the problem as a way to do that. And the reason they do this is because they want to maintain control. If you are deficient in some personality qualities and you find it very scary to risk, show up, be known, be exposed, feel shame, feel very strong emotions, your agenda then is to stay safe. And the way you stay safe is you don't lose control. You maintain control at all the time. So when something comes up that's problematic, that's really risky because that means taking ownership and taking ownership then means might be exposure, risky, shame, all these negative things they don't want to feel. So they manage it from not of a standpoint of let's solve the problem. They manage it from the standpoint of protecting self and offloading the uncomfortable emotions to preferably you. So what happens is what's called drama triangles, these drama cycles. In fact, there's at least five or more different ones and different people have different kind of mode of operandi. There's the people who never want to be wrong. They always need to be right. So whatever you do or suggest, it becomes an argument about who's right and who's wrong. They'll always maintain the angle of their right and make sure that you know that the problem isn't with them. There's others who always want to be dependent. They want you to know that they need you and they're never going to not need you. So they can't have a solution. So they'll do everything they can to sabotage any solution that you bring up in order to maintain the position of, I am i can't live without you. I need you. That's more the dependent personality disorder. So How do we recognize, in fact, let me even stand back for a second. How do we then recognize the fact that we've met somebody who's not about solving a problem, but rather activating drama? Well, they do two things. In fact, it just happened. It happened on a live here for those who I'm also on TikTok at the same time. And someone just came in and said, hi, granny. Now, I honestly, that's an effort to activate me. So what they do is they push buttons And when there's a button push, you react. And then with your reaction will cause a reaction in them, which pushes a button with them. Then they react, which then you feel like your button's pushed. So you react. So this is back and forth. 
button pushed, react, rack, button pushed, and it's back and forth, back and forth. So the only way to stay out of this is not is not to get into it at all. In fact, once you fall prey to the start of this, I found this very fascinating. I was listening to Dr. Gottman talk about this. Not John Gottman. This is a different Gottman. And he said that once you're in, once you've fallen into a drama cycle where you've reacted. So, for example, if I had responded to that troll who came on and said, "Hi, Granny," once I then engage, I'm in the drama, and you can't get out of a drama once you're in it. Once you're in it, once you fall prey to it, you're stuck. So the only way to avoid it is to set up, uh, set up a firm boundaries of what you know you're going to do when you get engaged this way, and then be very, very ready to to implement it. Yes, it is a form of not engagement, but it also might be more. It might be more more stern. It might even be more strict than just not engagement. It may be that you actually do things like leave. Or there's a consequence, some kind of a consequence. Like if you're, it's an employee, it may mean that you fire this employee. But you may, as a therapist, it may mean that you stop being the person's therapist. But there's got to be some kind of a consequence, not simply just just not engage and pretend it didn't happen. But there has to be, it's actually when this starts to happen on a consistent basis, when there's this pushing like this, it's, it's a violation of the frame of your relationship. The nomenclature... The names that we're using, the terminology we're using is changing. So if you watch the people that I would consider the experts on social media, because they're also rooted in research, they're really up on the latest, I would say Dr. Romani is one of the best. Wonderful, wonderful person. I would say Sam Vinkman's right behind her, but Dr. Romani is actually a psychologist who does training. She's well-versed in personality disorders and specifically with narcissistic personality disorders. I sat in a seminar. Actually, she was live. So I was sat in training with her this year, and she discussed the fact that we've been using the terminology of covert narcissist inappropriately. It's wrong. And then she described what covert narcissism actually is. It is a word but it's describing something else. So I wanted to kind of educate all of us and bring us up to date. What we've met in the past, when we say the word covert narcissist, we're talking about what's really actually referred to in psych circles as a vulnerable narcissist. There are several different types of narcissists. There's the overt, there's a malignant, destructive, or also referred to as a narcissistic sociopath. There's the hero or the communal narcissist. And then there's the vulnerable narcissist and then there's somatic slash sexual narcissist. So there's about four to five different categories. The covert narcissist, which is what we refer, which is actually the vulnerable narcissist, is the perpetual victim. Normally, narcissists sort of use some emphasis, some talent of theirs as a way to get attention. Maybe if you think of the overt, the grandiose, the braggart, this person may be the best Maybe they're a professor and they know everything there is about miniature trains. And so whenever they show up, they take the floor and hold the floor as as the expert about whatever their topic is. And they're the go-to person and they're just larger than life and whatever it is. I think of, for example, I don't know how many of you watch the show Barry. It's Barry on HBO. I, I love Barry on HBO. The acting teacher who has a French name, that's a perfect example of an overt narcissist. He is supposedly the creme de la creme when it comes to being an actor and also acting technique. Yes, Gene, exactly. That's his name, Gene. So that's a great example of what overt narcissist would look like. Covert, vulnerable, see, I use, I use slip and use the same words. Vulnerable narcissist is the inverse. It's the opposite. This is the person who is the perfect victim. Everything goes wrong. Nothing's ever goes right. I would say maybe George Costanza on Seinfeld might be an example. I'm trying to think of other TV examples. They're the, you know, I, I know that people don't like it when I do this, but they remind me of Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. Like it can be sunny and there'll be a little tiny cloud and he'll say, it's going to rain today. And Pooh's like, what do you mean? It's all cloud. It's all sunny. He goes, well, there's a rain cloud over in the distance and I know it's going to rain and it will rain on me. So they always see, they always see uh, how it can go wrong. Yeah, Sally on Barry kind of has some traits, but she's not a perfect example. She does have things that go well, but yes, she has a lot of that traits. I would agree that Sally is a little leaning into that direction, but Eeyore is a great example on Winnie the Pooh. George Costanza, who can never get a date, would be another. Somebody suggesting maybe Wendy Ozark. Actually, Wendy to me is a sociopath, and I don't see Wendy as a 
Wendy's not even a narcissist. Wendy is a calculating, ruthless sociopath. She'll even use her kids to the advantage, the, to the political advantage that it gives her, which is why she pushes and pushes. I don't know if you guys have seen any YouTube analysis of Ozark. The parallels between Darlene and Wendy, and then the 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 op, the man who was Darlene's husband and Marty are very similar. They're both on the same track. Both wives were driving the marriages into catastrophic positions, very catastrophic. So yes, the Snells, exactly. So yeah, I'm trying to think of another example of uh, everything always going wrong. Oh, I know one. It's, well, this is really old. So I'm dating myself. Mash, you know, the guy who was having an affair with a really lovely blonde and um, he was kind of doofus and it would, uh, things would, he was like always a perpetually falling apart on him. He was another good example of a vulnerable narcissist. So let me explain what is covert narcissism then? What are we actually talking about? Yes, Frank. Exactly. Frank's a good example on MASH. Um, so what are we talking about with covert narcissism? Covert and overt narcissism. And I know you can't confuse grandiose slash covert narcissist with overt narcissism, but there's covert and overt narcissism. So covert narcissism is everything that the narcissist feels on the inside of themselves. That's the distractibility they have, the chronic boredom, the excessive preoccupation with whoever they're fantasizing about. It's all the interior experiences that they have. It's the things we don't, we don't see and know, but they have on the inside of them. So for you to understand what that would be like is when you have a cold, it's how you feel when you have a cold, you know, how your throat's scratchy and your head aches and you have a fever and your body hurts. That's, that would be, that would be the equivalent of a covert narcissism, for example. Overt narcissism is everything that we see when we're around them. That's the excessive talking. They don't share the floor. They interrupt a lot. They brag. They don't care about what's going on in your life. All these things that you experience by being around them and you witness, that's overt narcissism. So why, why correct this? Well, just so that we're all on the page, because if you start to see this in literature or in other places when you read up about it, that way you know when you see a vulnerable narcissist is what we used to refer to as covert narcissist. And now when you see covert narcissism or overt narcissism, now you know what we're actually, what we're actually uh, talking about. How do we deal with them? Well, that's the tricky part. That's the really, really tricky part. Because, you know, do we just tell all the personality disorders, sorry, we're going to have a relationship with you? Well, that, that's a third to, uh, a, you know, almost a quarter of the world that we would be saying that to. And I'm not just talking about narcissists. I'm talking about all personality disorders. I do think what it takes is that we have to be very, very aware that these types of relationships are not going to be reciprocal relationships that they are people that we probably can't avoid. There's your boss at work, or maybe it's a coworker. It might be a neighbor that there are, there's going to be maybe a, da a daughter-in-law or one of your grandchildren or somebody in your life is going to, you're going to bump into that has these issues. We're not going to be able to avoid it. But what I do think it means is that we have to reduce our exposure, that we don't walk into relationships with the assumption that I can trust and share who I am with this person, that this person has to earn the right to know us and earn the right to our trust. I know for me, that is a really different way of thinking about this, that I, you know, especially if you're raised in more of a dysfunctional home, dysfunctional homes want you to accept everything that's happening in the home because God forbid that you say there's a problem in the home. The problem has to be with you. They kind of set up rules for the children as a way to sort of cope with this. So that means some of us have to relearn how we, we step into relationships so that we don't we don't walk in with the same level of vulnerability, the same level of expectations. That we take our time getting to know people and take our time in building relationships with people. And that we, we I don't want to think of it as testing, like that to me feels very calculating, but you need to pay attention. I just, there was a TikTok I watched yesterday about a woman who says, I have never had my heart broken and I've been dating for the past two years. How do I do that? And then she said, I don't react, I observe. And I would, I, I think that's very wonderful advice. I think we need to get into the position where we learn to sort of watch what people do and observe their actions and whatever they tell us, we believe them. We believe them. 
If they tell us from the beginning, I'm not good at X, Y, Z, you now know they're not good at X, Y, Z. Don't think that you're going to be the exception. We have to also, here's another hard part, and maybe this is something we'll have to unpack more. If you don't understand what I'm saying, please let me know, and I'd be happy to go into a little bit further. But we have to get better at meeting our own needs and not walking into a relationship with unmet needs, hoping somehow they're going to fix these things for us because they're not. They're not. In fact, that was her second point. She takes care of her own needs. Now, that does that mean we can't ever be intimate and never lean on anyone? No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that we need to be careful when we step into these relationships that we don't come in sort of like you going grocery shopping hungry. How well does that work out for you? Probably not well at all. So we need to go into these relationships with a sort of a different expectation of we need to observe We need to have a period of time in which we see whether or not this person has is trusting to other people, whether or not they keep other people's secrets or if they're a gossip. You know, there's things that we just need to watch for and wait until and see what happens and see whether or not they it bears out to whether or not we can start to dip our toe in and and share more and more of ourselves. I think that's the way we have to approach it, which is like I said, for me it's a very different mindset. So let me review the four types of narcissist or five types. I think there's actually five types. The first is the overt or grandiose narcissist. That's more of the braggart, the person who sort of takes front and center. They're very familiar. It's sort of the traditional perspective of the narcissist. Next one is what I was talking about a few minutes ago, which is the vulnerable narcissist. We also in the past have referred to them as a covert narcissist. The third type is the somatic or and or sexual. So somatic is sort of the top view, and then the sexual is sort of a subcategory. This is the person who's very preoccupied with them, their bodies, their appearance, their physical experiences. You might see it around the gym. They might be somebody who's really excessively in plastic surgery. It could be the opposite. It doesn't mean they're all about fitness. It could be that they're all about indulgences where they excessively, you know, they, they really... Uh, they struggle, they're very into food and they struggle with food and they, they have a weight issue. So it's not necessarily their fit. It just is a preoccupation with the body. You might see it around medical issues, like they may be somebody who is always something's wrong with them. Now be very careful because there are people who have chronic illnesses and they're living with a lot of chronic pain and they're, that, you know, with pain always happening, it's very hard not to have other things not take as much precedence. So be careful with that one. But I have seen people who sort of use their illnesses or struggles as a way to sort of gain attention. So that's the third type. The fourth type is the malignant or destructive or also a narcissistic sociopath. This is the person who's both narcissistic personality disorder slash antisocial personality disorder. They're both they're both together. So they're sociopaths who are narcissists. And so as a result, you get somebody who's very entitled and arrogant, but they're ruthless, very ruthless. And they have no problems breaking the law and they have no conscience. So there's nothing they won't do in order to get an advantage. So that's number four. And then the fifth one is the hero slash communal. This is the person who's the do-gooder. They're doing a lot of really wonderful things. You'll see them on boards, or they do a lot of service, they're active at church. That's the group that generally isn't cheating. I know that there's this idea that everyone cheats. Yeah, a lot of the other subtypes do cheat, but this type tends not to because they have a reputation to uphold. And they usually want the society, the culture that they live in to think that they're all that, but the family knows that it's a completely different story. Very, very different. So how do you break a trauma bond? What happens with these relationships, when we get caught into a trauma, when we get, let me say that again, when we get caught into the drama and we're reacting and one of the things that they hold over us as a fear, like a threat, is that if we don't participate properly in this drama with them, letting them have control or letting them always be right or letting them take care of us or whatever it is, it could even be nice things like saving us. But if we don't participate in the drama, they hold a threat over our heads that they're going to withdraw their attention and love and care for us or something. They threaten us with something. Maybe that we, they threaten themselves with themselves. They may hurt themselves or hurt, take the kids away or something, but they hold some kind of threat over us. And then they do another thing, which actually several things, but one of the other things they do is they also then withhold their attention and love towards us, which by the way, over time gets less and less anyway, but 
but you start to feel this conditionalness to the relationship. It's on their terms. So if you don't show up and agree to whatever the role they ask you to play, then there's going to be this massive loss. That threat to us, to the person who's in the relationship, is horrible feeling. Horrible feeling because we went into this f- with expectation that we're going to share ourselves and share our lives with someone. We expected that this would be a reciprocally intimate relationship. And now we're seeing that it's traditional. I'm sorry, conditional. Yeah, it can be traditional for some of us, but it's conditional. And as a result, we don't want that. And we also thought we really met a wonderful person and we don't want to lose that. And usually this starts to happen. We're becoming increasingly aware of it when we've been made some type of big commitment with them, like we've bought a house or we've moved in or we're pregnant or we maybe we've started a business together. That's what happened in my case. We usually have done something together that now we're committed. This has now become complicated. So to divest all of this is going to be a massive loss, a massive loss. So the fear of that creates a bond. It's a fear-based bond, and it's what we call a trauma bond. It's also referred to, Patrick Carnes is the one who coined this term. He also calls it a betrayal bond because it's often based on betrayal. We're feeling betrayed by what's happening. And we're being asked to betray our values in order to stay in the relationship and betray staying good to ourselves. So it's a massive loss. So how do you break it? This is difficult. And I know I just right here, people are saying, just walk away, just leave, go no contact. Well, yes, ultimately, yes, that's the goal. That's the goal. But that's not easy in the beginning. In the beginning, you have all this investment and they're very good at threatening They're very good at threatening. They will threaten equal mass, they'll threaten mass destruction. Are you aware that I have other social media platforms? I have short form videos on TikTok and Instagram, as well as posts on Instagram, and then longer form on YouTube. Recently, I just posted a blind reaction video to TLC's hit show, Unexpected. Be sure to check it out and let me know what you think. You can find me across most platforms at the handle of Carrie McAvoy PhD. I'm saying it's not that simple. I know that most of us, when we see people around us, say it's a friend or it's our, maybe it's our sister or it's a loved one that's in one of these relationships and we get frustrated because we see them stay and they, we see them being abused. It's really hurtful and hard for us to watch this happen to these people. But what we don't appreciate is what's it like on the inside. And I'm going to tell you, you probably only know 10% of what's going on in that relationship. They probably cannot divulge to you the terror and the horror and the pain and the threats and the abuse that they're living with that is making it very, very difficult for them to leave. So trust me to say that the reason people just don't go no contact and don't just walk out is because there's massive threats being laid out and they're very good. In fact, I was just listening to the seminar of Dr. Gottman as well as Dr. Lester talk about this. They have a reptilian-like style of being able to identify your most vulnerable things about you and targeting and hitting them. They're eerily accurate at their ability to know what's going to really hurt you and they have no qualms of using that against you in order to leverage you so that you are stuck. I know that's what most people in the public who's not been in the inside of one of these relationships don't understand. And that's what I didn't understand, even as a psychologist who sat with 20 years of patients, 20 years of patients, and I know a big group of my patients coming through was living with somebody with narcissistic or personality traits, and I did not appreciate the degree that this relationship was destroying them, threatening them, and taking away their power. I didn't understand that there was massive, massive abuse and um, that these people were stuck. They were trapped. So it's easy to say all of this, but yeah, it's really hard. So what do we do to break the, back to the trauma bond? What do we do to break it? Because what has to happen, it has to happen inside of you before you're able to do something practically. You have to make a mental shift and then the mental shift help gives you the clarity that you need because anyone who's had a trauma bond knows you're now in a mental fog and you're not functioning well. 
So you have to get start to let the fog clear so that you can get better direction. Let's talk about resolving the cognitive dissonance. What is even that? What does that even mean? Because I know it's a big word. Really what it is, is that it is two opposing ideas occurring at the same time and you want to, you know you need to choose one and you want one more than the other and it's probably not a wise decision. Say that you're living on a budget, maybe it's near the end of the month and you spent a lot of money and you kind of like nearing the end of your financial budget and you see something that you really, really want and it's expensive and it's going to break the budget. You know that's going to break the budget. But you're afraid that if you don't buy it now, that may not be here when you come back. So you stand there and you look at it and that moment when you're standing there considering the decision, that what you're experiencing inside, that is called cognitive dissonance. It's cognitive, meaning thinking, cognition, thinking, and you're having a fight within yourself about what you should do or shouldn't do. Cognitive dissonance. You're feeling like, no, I shouldn't spend the money, but it might not be here when I get back and I really want that and I might never get a chance to buy it again. No, but you're going to, like, how can you afford this? And if you just wait a week, that, that is called cognitive dissonance. So how does it happen in these abusive relationships? What, how does that have to do like buying a shirt or what we eat for lunch or whatever other decisions that we make have to do with what happens in the, these relationships? Well, it's more, it's bigger. It's really nasty. So what happens when you meet somebody who has a personality disorder? They can't actually present themselves as they truly are. They want you to like them. So they, and some of them are ruthless about this. Some of this is not like, you know, they're doing this, um, some of them is not just simply, I want to like you. Some of them is, I want you in a relationship. And I'm going to do whatever I can do to get you in one, even if it's tricking you, fooling you, and deceiving you. That was the situation with my case. I was presented with somebody who didn't exist. Most of us are. So the love bombing phase is deliberately to get you into the relationship, and they present with you who you want to see. They make themselves up on the fly to mirror and mimic you. So as you share about yourself, then they they say things to you to let you know that they are like you. And it is literally created in that moment. And I've had people who do this confess that it's that's what they do. You know, if you're into a certain author, oh, they're into that or author. And if you liked a certain kind of music and you really love so-and-so, they suddenly like so-and-so. And so they literally create themselves on the fly to, to mimic you so that you feel like you've met somebody like yourself. But it's more than that. They also do a lot of excessive eye gazing. They often will touch you, like like touch your arm. They'll make physical contact. It's kind of a, a way to sort of uh, break the ice with you. And then they will, they will mirror your position. So uh, some of this I know because psychology, we teach our therapists to do this because it's a fast way to build rapport. Yes, therapists do this too. And salesmen do it. They're trained to do it as well. So they will mirror your body. So if you sit down and cross your legs and it legs pointing to the right, they will sit down, cross their legs and point their legs to the right as well. If you sort of bend your shoulders, they'll bend your sh their shoulder as well. Or if you tip your head, they'll tip your head. It's often, believe it or not, you don't, you'd think you would notice this, but you don't notice that you're being mirrored. But it creates this, the symmetry of it creates this sense of similarness, similarliness. I can't say that word right, but like they're like you. And it makes you feel, it makes you more suggestible and you start to feel this more, more likely to feel trust with them. It, and so all of this is to influence you so that you're more receptive and you feel more warm to them, more, you give them, you give more belief to them than they have earned. That's, that's the real crux of it. It's shortcutting the process of trust and earning respect. It shortcuts it, short circuits it actually. And you feel more of that than you should because they haven't earned it. But because of these techniques they're using, you feel it. And by the way, this comes out of cult programming. Cult leaders do the same thing. That's how they bring in new initiatives is by doing the, they train their apostles or di disciples to go out and do stuff like this. So it's actually, and the military does it too. That's how they break soldiers down. And, you know, so yes, it's established, it's very established style of brainwashing. It's what it is. So they, so they do this. And so you don't really know that you've not met a real person. You think you've met a real person and you really fall for this person because you've never met someone so similar to you. And whether or not you realize it or not, we all are looking for ourselves. We really would love to meet me or you. You would love to meet you and I'd love to meet me. 
And as a result of this, this is, it makes us feel vul- we're very vulnerable to this. And we're hardwired for belonging. Abraham Maslow says on the hierarchy of needs that the sense of belonging is one near the bottom, one of the lower ones. It's one of we're we're based on needing to be in relationships. So this is it taps into this. It, it really taps into this. But you don't know that you didn't meet a real person. There's who they truly are and who you think you met. And just that fact, just that difference already is creating cognitive dissonance because your body and your mind is sophisticated enough to pick up that they're not who they say they are. You at some level know something's not quite right, probably not at a conscious level that you could say out loud. Something's not quite adding up, but here's an example how it happened to me. I knew enough of it was not adding up that believe it or not, despite me feeling radically over top in love with this guy, I hired a private investigator to research his background and not, not, I'm not talking the $30 a month online ones. I'm hired a PI who used to work for U.S. intelligence. I actually hired a real deal to do a digital background check into this person. My question was this, is he truly divorced like he says, and is he living alone? That's my question. So I got a report back, 11 page report of everything this guy's job he had, his legal history, his financial debt history, and his residences where he lived. And then the PI said, no, it does not appear. I cannot verify for sure he's been divorced every single time. But based upon the the amount of usage he's using in his apartment, it looks like he's living alone. Now, why would I do that? If you really have met somebody who is perfectly wonderful, why would I want to do a bad, why would I spend the money? It wasn't cheap, guys. Why would I spend the money to do that? Because something inside me said things weren't adding up. And I couldn't tell you what. I just knew it was enough to bother me to have spent the money. So you sense that from the beginning that you meet this person. You're sensing this, du- it's called a duality. The duality of who they really are versus who they appear to be. And then as the relationship starts to develop and gets more serious, more committed, the intensity of the cognitive dissonance increase because they start to let the mask slip and you start to see the real self. You start to learn of the betrayals. You start to catch the lies. And then you're wondering what's really true. Is the lies true or is what, what who you think you met and who they are most of the time true? And you can't tell. And then you end up starting to wonder whether or not is the relationship good? Should I be in a relationship or should I should I get out of the relationship? So all of that, you start into this thing of, What's real? I don't know what's real. Is this person good or is this person bad? Are they cheating again? Or, you know, is, was that only the one time? You, you get into this big, huge of indecisiveness, indecision, and all of that, that causes actually neurological damages. That's cognitive dissonance at a big, big level that causes com- incredible confusion. And the confusion then begins to have a very detrimental effect on you, which ultimately then starts to diminish your level of functioning because you can't resolve it. You don't know what's real. So how do you how do you fix this? And then as a result, you're afraid to leave because of the bond. And they're going to like destroy you if you do leave and you don't want to lose everything you guys built together. So what do you do? That's what happens. That's how you get paralyzed and get stuck. Here's the hard part. This is the part I had a real hard time with. I know personally how hard it is. Really hard. You have to resolve what's real. You have to, in your mind, figure it out. How I tried to figure it out, and I tell you what I did and why it won't work for you, please don't do this. I tried to find the truth. I kept thinking if I catch him, if I follow him, find out he's cheating, find out he's lying, catch some big betrayal that it will be enough that now I can like, oh, now I know and I can leave. There isn't enough. It's just like dieting, you know, when you're when you're struggling with food and struggling with diet and you think, oh, there's going to be some number on the scale that I'm going to feel suddenly okay and good about myself. And there isn't a number. We all know that. There's, In fact, we look back at our old photos and wonder what our problem was because we looked great back then, but we didn't feel great. That's the same thing's going to happen with this. The same thing will happen with this. There isn't a place of knowing enough or knowing bad enough, knowing there isn't a place. You have to decide it's enough. You have to d- mentally say to yourself, this isn't adding up. This is not how I'd be want to be treated. People who love me don't do these things to me. They don't call me names. They don't make me feel crazy. They don't 
criticize me for doing hard work and doing good things for the house. They don't run me down. <clears throat> they don't put me down. They don't keep me up super late at night and set the alarm super early in the morning and then run me all day and then want to know what my problem is and why I'm exhausted. They don't do all of these things. That's not love. Love supports me, protects me, looks out for me, guards me, has my best interest at the front of their minds and hearts. That's what love is. You have to decide that. And then once you decide that, you'll start to break free. The more I learn about trauma bonds and cognitive dissonance, the more horrified I feel. It's one thing to survive something like this, but to know that I'm one of millions who have suffered such a travesty, I find utterly shocking. If you'd like to learn more, to get an inside, up-close look at what it's like, then you're going to want to read my book, Love You More, The Harrowing Tale of Lies, Sex Addiction, and Double Cross. It gives you a graphic, raw depiction of narcissistic abuse. You can buy it. It's an ebook, audiobook, paperback, and hardcover at all available major online bookstores. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And until Monday, I'll see you then. Bye bye.